Well, I'm very pleased that we have Hank Greenberg here today. We've already talked about him and his career. Uh, let me just reiterate it. It's the most amazing career. Uh, it starts when you landed on D-Day, right? On Omaha Beach. That's amazing. <laughs> and at age 17, 18? A little over 18 there. Uh, and, and this goes way, and then liberated, uh, participated in the liberation of Dachau after, at the end of World War II. And then, not to be stopped, was involved in the Korean War as well. And then uh, took over a insurance company and made it into the most important insurance company in the world. Uh, and uh, experienced a number of vicissitudes connected with that as well. So uh, I, I was uh, asking Mr. Greenberg if he would talk about uh, what he did, how he made this uh, enormous success, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, we're interested in finance here, so it's something about how it was financed, but that, as we've been emphasizing in this course, it's more than just mathematical CAPM modeling, it's about incentivizing people, about finding people with the right character, and uh, I think that you can tell us <laughs> about your um, experiences and what you've learned for so many years. So I'll, I'll turn over to you, and then we'll have, uh, we'll, st we'll stop at around 10, and then we have time for a few questions from you. All right, Mr. Right. Greenberg. Good morning. Let me start really uh, uh, picking up where the professor. I enlisted in the Army when I was 17. I hadn't finished high school. Uh, World War II was on. I felt I wanted to do something, and I was bored. Uh, so I was able to uh, fix a birth certificate so it said I was 18. And uh, they had no problem taking me because they weren't looking too closely. Uh, I went to Europe, went to England first. I got there in 1943, a year before the invasion. Spent a year training. Uh, left England, went to the continent, obviously on D-Day. And went all the way through Europe. Uh, linked up with the Russians in Linz, Austria. The war was then over. Uh, came back. I had to finish high school, uh, which was a uh, which was a chore, coming back and uh, after being in a war and going back to high school was one of the toughest times of my life, actually. Uh, but I did, went on to college and uh, law school. Uh, finished law school and the Korean War broke out. I was a reserve officer. I had gotten commissioned toward the end of the war. Um, spent the year in Korea. Um, separated as a captain. Came close to staying in the military um, because I was fairly young and had moved up pretty well in rank and uh, was offered uh, trying to incentivize me to stay in the military, but I didn't. Um, but I finished law school and came back. I was married by then, married, just a uh, married uh, girl that I met in college. Um, and uh, I had to get a job. Uh, I didn't feel like practicing law. Um, I didn't think I didn't had a law degree. I didn't think I wanted to do that. So I was visiting. I came back from Korea. And uh, the next day, went down to visit some of my friends who had been went to law school with. And uh, it convinced me that I didn't want to practice law. And as I left their office, I went by an insurance company, a Continental Casualty Company. And I thought I'd um, see if they had a job opening. So I went in, went up to the uh, personnel director, and he was kind of nasty. Now, I had just come back from Korea, and I, I came back, I had orders to fly back, so I was really very untamed at that moment. Uh, you know, just only about four days before that, uh, I still almost had mud on my boots. And so 
I went down to the main floor, looked around the directory, and there was a resident vice president by the name of Bob, 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 Bob Reed. I just walked into his office and said, you have a, the word I used was not the one I use now, uh, you don't have a very good personnel director. And uh, I was a little more excited than that. And um, I wound up getting a job. And I started as a junior underwriter in the insurance business. So what is a junior underwriter? You, annual, uh, you analyze risks and decide whether the company wants to write those risks or not. Um, and I had to get a job because I said I was married and had responsibilities. And I kind of liked it. Uh, I was working in this, what they call the special risk division, uh, which was uh, uh, different kinds of risks almost every day. Some were sports risks, uh, some was um, accidental death thing for executives. It was a whole range of different risks you had to analyze. I found it interesting. I became the youngest vice president in the history of that company. I moved to Chicago where its head office was. And uh, about uh, a couple of years later, um, it's a long story, so I won't take you through, I met Starr, C.V. Starr, who was the founder of the company that I chair today. Um, Starr started his company in China in 1919, uh, long time. And obviously during World War II, he had to leave, um, came back to the United States. And uh, he had a series of, of uh, small insurance companies. And um, I was intrigued uh, with his business because it operated outside the United States by and large. He had one company in the United States called the American Home, uh, which really was a failure. It was not doing well. And he was embarrassed by that fact that uh, uh, a company that was not doing well, that he owned, his other business, he represented American companies in doing business overseas. It was called the AIU, American International Underwriters. It was one of a kind. And it operated mostly in Asia, uh, one or two European countries, but by and large, it was it had a it had a uh, uh, its its background was really Asian, having started in China, uh, as I said, 1919. So anyway, I joined uh, Star and took over the American home uh, in New York, which I said was was not doing well. It was a it was a failure. Now what was what was wrong with it? Uh, it did business through agents, and depending upon the skill of a company, uh, would determine the quality of the agents that it had. And, and while it was an old company, it, was, it had a very poor agency organization. Uh, and so the quality of its business uh, was very, very, very poor. So it was losing money uh, year in and year out. Uh, and uh, the job I had was to turn it around. Uh, to cut that short, I got rid of all the agents and went into what they call the brokerage business. Instead of writing small businesses, we began writing large commercial risks. And we needed a lot of reinsurance. I went to London, got Lloyd's to back uh, that, uh, that strategy. Um, and. Uh, up to then, most of the large risks were being written in London at Lloyd's. Very few American companies uh, had the skills to underwrite large, complicated risks, whether it was large property risk or casualty or marine, aviation, very difficult risks. Um, and we assembled a group of, of quality underwriters, um, and, we were, and we started doing that. We ultimately became the largest uh, brokerage underwriting company in the United States. We were going to run out of capital. We were growing so rapidly and successfully. Um, so I looked around for a couple of other companies 
that had the same uh, problems that we had uh, before we turned it around. Um, found one called the National Union. Uh, we bought that, got rid of all of its agents and agency business, and consolidated that into American Home. Kept its identity, because it was a very old company. It was one of the oldest companies in the United States. And then uh, subsequently bought the, uh, the New Hampshire Insurance Company, did the same thing. By now it's 19, uh, in the mid 60s, and by 1967, I created AIG, put a holding company on top of these three companies, and AIG was born. Um, in 67, I also became the, the, uh, the head of C.V. Star and Company, which was the owner, by and large, of these insurance companies. Uh, Star died in 1968, but he saw the beginning of AIG that was formed. We also owned a life insurance company called American Life that did business outside the United States. And we consolidated that into AIG. So we had both a life and a non-life business. And we were expanding internationally. We ultimately did business in 130 countries. We opened markets around the world. We introduced new uh, types of insurance. One of the things that made us different was that we continued to, to evolve new products that by the business or, or, uh, or individuals needed. For example, we were the first ones to introduce directors and officers liability insurance in the United States. We introduced political risk insurance. American companies doing business in very difficult environments where their business might be nationalized or confiscated, we insured against those risks. We introduced kidnap <coughs> ransom insurance, American companies doing business in uh, not, so, not so friendly countries um, where some of the employees might be kidnapped and held for ransom. We insured against that. And we put together a unit that helped find and, and, and get their release, sometimes on a friendly basis, sometimes not so friendly basis. Uh, so we're very creative in developing products that American business needed around the world. We began to diversify because the, the insurance business, the property casualty business, is a very volatile business. You're subject to earthquakes, you're subject to hurricanes, you're subject to different uh, economic environments, and that affects the outcome of your business. Um, and so you, we wanted to diversify not just within the property casualty business, but globally. That's why we entered so many countries around the world, uh, which gave us diversification. More diversification in your business provides greater stability. And uh, that became one of, the, one of the things that was very important to us. We also focused on what the expense ratio should be. Most insurance companies are running an expense ratio of about 30%. We, we ran our company with an expense ratio of 19%. And how did we do that? Being the most efficient, uh, using reinsurance very, very uh, uh, properly. Uh, uh, so we did a much better job in both, uh, in both developing our business and managing the business in a more efficient way than others would do. And obviously, you have to have an organization. You got to surround yourself with people uh, who share the same values, the same, the same aspirations that you do. Um, you have to have a team uh, that works hand in glove, and we did. The senior management of AIG was like a band of brothers. Uh, we saw things alike. We worked well together. Um, I mean, there wasn't ever a palace revolution, anything like that. It was a, uh, it was a great organization. We added more diversification because that became, you know, clearly diversification was essential. But in order to do business in many countries, you had to open the market. Markets didn't, you know, welcome you in many countries. Take Japan, for example. It was a very closed market. Uh, Japanese 
were very reluctant to open their market to foreign insurers. Um, so we had, to, we had to force the market open, uh, and we did. Uh, we used the U.S. government was very, was very much on our side, and if the Japanese didn't open their market to us, uh, we, would, we worked hard to keep some of their own companies, whether it was insurance or otherwise, or other things, from doing business in the United States. We didn't hesitate to use the U.S. government to support uh, our desire to open markets around the world. When um, there was negotiation on trade, for example, most of the negotiation in the early years was on, was on goods in trade, things, not financial services. Financial services were not negotiated at the at World Trade um, negotiations, the WTO. Uh, we brought that into being. Um, I served on the President's Advisory Board for Trade Negotiations. They never heard of, 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 of uh, <coughs> negotiating financial services. And it took us a while to get that done, but we did. We opened the market for financial services to be, to be negotiated. And there are rules then uh, that came into existence so that you can negotiate uh, trade and services. It wasn't easy. Uh, even when the rules were changed, uh, countries dragged their feet. It took a long time to open, as I said, Japan, Korea, um, uh, China. It took me from 1975, the first time I visited China, to 1992 to get the first uh, life insurance license ever granted to a foreign company. Moreover, all other foreign companies afterwards were, could only get a license where they could only own 49%. We owned 100%. And, st and today, still, it's the only foreign company in China, life insurance company, that owns 100% of, uh, of the company. It wasn't easy. As I say, it took from 75 to 92. And I visited China every year, uh, a couple of times a year, to make that happen. But we did a lot of things for China. At the same time, we helped China. Uh, I lobbied very hard for China's entry into WTO, um, and which was a very important for our country and for China, and, for the wor and, and, and really for the world. So we were very active, and you had to be in foreign policy <coughs> matters. It was linked to our business. Uh, since we did business, as I said, in the, ultimately in 130 countries, uh, it became essential that we were at the leading edge of what the foreign policy issues were. We did business behind the Iron Curtain before the Iron Curtain came down in Hungary, Poland, and Romania. Moreover, I went to, I went to the Soviet Union in 1964 during the height of the Cold War and began a reinsurance relationship uh, with them. Um, and that, that lasted throughout the years. Even during the, the height of the Cold War, we had a relationship going on. It wasn't easy. Um, they thought I was in the CIA most of the time. Uh, it, was a, uh, difficult, it was a difficult thing, but we persisted. And uh, when, uh, when the uh, Iron Curtain came down, uh, we had a head start against anybody else. Um, doing business in Romania and Hungary and Poland before the curtain came down was not easy, but we built relationships so that when, the, when it did uh, happen, uh, we had a head start against anybody else. We operated all through Latin America, uh, the Middle East, uh, parts of Africa, and all of those are a story in themselves because in each country there was a, it was a different environment and you had to deal with different, and you had to deal with different uh, personalities in governments. Um, it was very difficult. But we also had some basic principles. We would never, never be involved in a bribe. Anybody in our company that got involved in anything like that would be fired instantly. Uh, we understood what the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act meant before they even had such a corrupt Foreign Practices Act. Uh, and so we had a reputation that you didn't tamper with us that way. And they knew we also that we wouldn't hesitate to retaliate through our government if necessary 
if they tried to keep us out of their country. So we were tough on that basis. We wanted open markets, uh, and we did. Now, you, you, you go back to what kind of a structure did we have, and how do you bring, how do you bring a group of people together um, that, um, that can work so harmoniously and, um, and enthusiastically together? It's critical. If you're gonna run a business like that, you have to have an organization uh, that really, everybody's on the same track, um, and, as, and everybody is enthusiastic about what they're doing. Um, our overseas people, um, we had what they call an MOP, mobile, mobile Overseas Personnel. It was like our own State Department. Um, you can be working in Nigeria today as a manager, and, and then and six months later you might be in, uh, in Singapore or some other country. Uh, so you have to be mobile, you have to be prepared to move, and, uh, and not be reluctant because of one thing or another. Um, and becoming an MOP was a very, it was a very high honor. We didn't put, everybody couldn't get that designation. You had to earn it. Um, and it was, a, it was a great group of people. But how do, you, how do you motivate people to do that? How do you get an organization uh, that can be so effective, um, AIG at its, at, at, at its pinnacle, uh, when I left in 2005, was, the, was by far the largest and most profitable insurance company in history. When you think about that, from a dead stop. Um, now we had a, a compensation structure that was unique to the industry. I mentioned it briefly to the professor. C.V. Starn Company was the, was, we considered to be the ultimate um, uh, company in the group. Uh, it was the, it, it spawned AIG. And so it, within the organization, it was viewed as the, as the top company in the group. And since we spawned AIG and, and put assets into uh, AIG in exchange for AIG stock, um, so, that, uh, so that CB Star and Star International, the two companies, owned in the beginning 100% of AIG. As we grew and we needed more capital, as we were growing so rapidly, uh, we had, had to raise capital, and therefore we got somewhat diluted. But even at the end, we controlled about 15% of AIG, but the, the market cap was close to $200 billion from a dead stop of 300 million when we first went public from 300 million to 200 billion dollars, one of the largest companies in the world. So we weren't afraid of anybody taking us over. Uh, nobody was big enough to even uh, to attempt that. But what we did, we had several principles. Nobody could earn more than a million dollars in salary. I, I put that rule in. Uh, two, nobody would have a contract. You stayed in AIG because you loved it, and you didn't have to have a contract. And I, I refused a contract uh, any number of times. But we, you got bonuses based on performance. And performance uh, was fairly rigid. We try to grow our business with close to 15% a year. And for many, many years, we achieved that, uh, that growth. The, the private companies that owned AIG stock, not owned by AIG, but by the private companies, we set up a, uh, a, a, a structure uh, where the private companies would allocate some AIG shares to individuals based on performance. At the end of every two years, if we hit, those, hit the goals that we had established, they'd have a certain number of AIG shares set aside for them uh, that they would get at retirement. So it was golden handcuffs. If you left the company, uh, you left behind the shares that were set aside for you. Uh, and these were worth an awful lot of money. Very few people left the company. I can assure you that uh, uh, it, was a great, it was a great incentive to stay. And those are the, the people we wanted to stay, the ones that got allocated shares, obviously. 
It cost AIG nothing. The public shareholders of AIG had no cost allocated to that. So the shareholders of AIG benefited uh, from that. And the, obviously the company overall benefited because it did so well. So it was a, um, it was a, um, it was a great organization. So what happened? Uh, in 2000, in the meantime, we had, a, we, had a, we had further diversified. Our life insurance business grew dramatically. We bought a company called Sun America, American General uh, Life, and so we became a very, a very major life and non-life company. And then we wanted to expand into financial services, uh, which we did. Uh, we had a, we had a consumer finance. Uh, we had a, uh, we had a thrift. Uh, all of which uh, was done because we could benefit from all the policyholders that we had, uh, that we cross market from one to the other, and so it was it was a natural for us to do that. And we had an enormous, we had close to a trillion dollars of assets. Uh, to be invested, obviously, and so we had the we had the funds and the capital that we needed to to finance these new startups, and that was going quite well. One day, I had a call from Senator Ribikov, who was a Connecticut uh, senator at the time, and he wanted me to meet a, a young fellow uh, who was running a financial services business. He had been with Drexel originally. And he came, he was a very bright guy. He came to us and we started something called AIG Financial Products. Um, it was a very successful uh, company. It did derivative business. Uh, everything was hedged. It was a very successful operation. Um, he got a little greedy um, on, uh, in, at, at one point and we separated. Uh, he left, we wanted him to leave. And, um, and we put somebody else in um, who was very, who was very, very good man. Um, well, most of these people were all PhDs in math. Um, they, they were a special breed. Um, they were different. And uh, in order to ensure that, that we knew what they were doing, we had a mirror uh, um, of all the computer systems that they used uh, for some of the um, things that they were doing. We had one off-site that mirrored every transaction that was being undertaken. Uh, we also had in the company what they call an enterprise risk management system, which means we, uh, we monitored both market risk and credit risk throughout our organization. Uh, because insurance is a risk business to begin with, and, uh, and you have to monitor risk. So we, that was part of our nature. We understood risk. And, uh, and, know, and knew how to balance it and how to manage it uh, in the insurance business and the financial business as well. After all, we had, a, we had to invest a trillion dollars of assets every year and growing. So clearly we had to know what we were doing. And uh, as I said, it was a very successful company. Um, in, in 2000 and, and uh, I guess it was, the, it was 2004, uh, the end of 2004, uh, we were um, reporting our earnings on a conference call with analysts. And one of the analysts asked me what the regulatory environment was like today. And um, I said, a, it's like a, a foot fault is like a murder charge. Uh, because things had changed dramatically after Enron in the United States. And the regulatory system um, became very, very difficult, and uh, anything at all was, it was uh, uh, really was being exaggerated beyond what you can disbelieve. The next day, we got a subpoena from Elliot Spitzer who then was the Attorney General in New York. Now, I should say a word about this, because <coughs> there was a major change in the regulatory environment after Enron. And in some states, in New York particularly, um, the Attorney General office has been used as a platform 
uh, to run for governor. It became a politicized office. And, uh, and Spitzer uh, had gone after, gone after me. He went after my son, Jeff, who was running Marsh McLennan, the largest insurance brokerage firm in the United States. Um, he went after Sandy Weil, who was running Citigroup, went after Merrill Lynch, uh, all to promote himself as a, uh, as a uh, attorney general uh, who was helping the people, quote, unquote. He destroyed several hundred billion dollars of value is what he did. He got elected governor, and you know the outcome of that. It was a very short, uh, a very short tenure. Um, he got caught uh, with prostitutes and had to resign. But he left behind a lot of broken, uh, a lot of broken companies. Um, I was forced to leave because he threatened uh, the board of directors of AIG, that if I didn't leave the company, he was going to indict the company. Um, he went on national TV and, uh, and accused me of, of uh, accounting fraud in the company. Uh, and just before Thanksgiving, uh, he dropped all those charges because nobody reads the newspapers the night before Thanksgiving. Um, he was a bad actor. Uh, so I left the company in 2005. Uh, the outcome was that uh, the plan actually had been that I would step down as CEO in May of that year uh, at the annual meeting and remain as, as chairman and see how the successor team would work. Uh, at that point, we had 92,000 employees and not a small company. Uh, to make sure that the, uh, that the new management team uh, would be able to handle the diverse businesses that we were in. These were all experienced people. There was nobody new in that role. I believe that we wanted to, uh, to have the new team come from within the company, not from outside. Uh, because they had to understand uh, what we were. And we had a culture in the organization that was quite unique. And you, you can't just change a culture of a company uh, instantly. It, you build a culture over many, many years. In any event, um, I was out. Uh, the new chap who came in, Martin Sullivan, who had been, in, who had been a senior man in the organization for years. But he attended every uh, senior staff meeting that we had for years. We used to meet, we had several different, I won't go through all of that, but several senior management meetings that were critical to knowing what was going on throughout the organization on a real-time basis. We'd meet every Monday morning, uh, about 15 people, uh, represented the entire organization. They'd be reporting on everything that was happening on a real-time basis. Uh, we did, a, there was a second meeting held on a Wednesday every morning uh, that um, that dealt with hedging um, uh, full-time and risk management. Uh, those two subjects were on, an, uh, on a real-time basis weekly. Uh, and of course, there were people working on that on a daily basis. But the, anything that was out of the ordinary uh, would be surfaced at these meetings. For some reason or other, uh, he discontinued those meetings. I can't understand why, but he did. And what's very disturbing is that the, 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 the audit committee of AIG's board knew that and did nothing about it. Uh, the outcome of that was then that um, AIG Financial Products loaded up on credit default swaps. They did more credit default swaps in the nine months after I left the company than we had done in seven years. Uh, now, let me say something about credit default swaps because I think it is important. A credit default swap originally, originally was, was created so that if a, a security, in this case uh, uh, CDOs, uh, which was really a, a product that was uh, mostly real estate put together and packaged and sold as a CDO, 
Originally, uh, those instruments had to have a default before a credit default, before a CDS a credit default swap would respond uh, to that instrument that defaulted. Someplace along the line, that was changed uh, so that you didn't have to, the instrument didn't have to default. It simply had to be lose value and you had to put up collateral. The, the one who issued the credit default swap had to put up collateral uh, equal to what the, the loss of value, even though it wasn't realized, uh, of what the CDO uh, had lost in value. Um, that change had, a ma had a major, uh, played a major role in what happened in the recession that we've just been going, have gone through. Uh, particularly on Wall Street. Um, putting up more collateral meant you had to have a lot of cash on hand. No matter how big you were, if, um, it became a very, became a very um, important issue as to the ultimate demise of several companies, including the problems that AIG ran into. They were called on for billions and billions of dollars of, um, of collateral which ultimately, I don't care how big you are, you run out of, out of cash, which they did. Um, one of the problems was in trying to determine what is the value of a CDO, since there was no, um, there was no price discovery, because there was no exchange in which you traded the CDOs on. That was, strangely enough, during the Clinton administration, uh, the Treasury Department, then run by Bob Rubin, uh, turned down the, the question of having an exchange and regulating credit default swaps. So you had a, a situation where every broker-dealer had a different price for a CDO. So what was the, you know, how much collateral did you really need to put up if you couldn't tell what the price one was. Um, in this instance, Goldman Sachs had the lowest price of any CDOs that were being called on for collateral. And since AIG Financial Products did a great deal of business with Goldman Sachs, they were being called on for more and more collateral, and they ran out of cash. Now, the insurance companies were all very, very solvent. They had at state regulated, you can't just take their capital uh, for something else. They were protected, all the policyholders were protected um, under the fact that there was state law and not federal law that governed the, um, the insurance companies. But AIG ran into difficulties. I was not in the company. I wouldn't have, I would have handled it much differently uh, had I been there. I would not have responded uh, to the call for collateral when you couldn't tell what the price discovery really was. Uh, I would have said, you know, I should add one other thing. AIG was a AAA rated company when I was there. The day I left the company, it lost its AAA rating. So if you, if you were AAA rated, you did not have to post collateral. If you were not AAA rated, you had to post collateral. So AIG ran out of cash. So they turned to the, they turned to the Fed uh, for, for help. You've got to remember, this is now at a time when Bear Stearns uh, first uh, got in trouble, and they found a, they found a buyer in, in J.P. Morgan, which really J.P. Morgan got Bear Stearns for nothing, practically. Uh, there were six months in between Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers. What did they do during that six months, the government that is, to prepare for any kind of financial upheaval? There was no plan to deal with what was about to uh, descend in the financial markets in the United States. So Lehman Brothers, uh, who could have been saved by the Fed, and was let to go down, 
And that caused a run on virtually all the banks. Uh, the loss of confidence that ensued when Lehman Brothers was let, was let go, go into bankruptcy, uh, startled the financial world. And everybody that had any money in any of the investment banks or banks was pulling money out. And so there was a, you couldn't borrow any money, uh, the markets froze. Uh, and so there was an ad hoc approach to doing the things. So, so Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, uh, both of which were gonna have a, a problem, were given a bank holding company license. That gave them access to the Fed window and they, had, you know, they could borrow money at very, virtually no cost at all, practical. The Hartford Insurance Company here in Hartford, medium-sized company, was also given a bank holding company license. And AIG was denied one. So AIG was left to really find a solution. So they went to the Fed, the New York Fed, which I had chaired incidentally for about seven years before. So I knew the people in the Fed quite well. Uh, they borrowed $85 billion from the New York Fed at 14.5% interest. And the Fed took 79.9% of the equity of the company. So they essentially nationalized the company. Uh, now the, the money that the, the AIG got, the 85 billion, uh, at, at, at these terms was just outrageous. They then had to pay the, CD, the CDOs that you couldn't tell what the real price was because there was no price discovery. You could, you could have negotiated to the value of those at about 40 to 60 cents on the dollar but the Fed made them pay 100 cents on the dollar. So AIG borrowed the money, paid Goldman Sachs and others 100 cents on the dollar and had to pay that money back to the Fed. Uh, so things began to unravel very quickly after that. Uh, they, they were obviously, uh, they lost credibility in the marketplace. They were losing business left and right. They had to pay back the government. Uh, so one thing led to another. Uh, the Treasury put in uh, a man by the name of Ed Liddy to run the company. Uh, he'd be on nobody's list to succeed running AIG. He hadn't got a clue how to do that. And they began to sell off uh, assets of AIG at, at really at prices that were just outrageous. So the outcome is AIG is a, is a um, a shadow of what had been. It's, it, the government now owns 92% of AIG. They want to sell that 92%. It'll take at least, in my view, three to four years, because it's an overhang. If they sell 10%, everybody knows there's another 80% to be sold, and so the stock will go no place. Uh, so, you know, do I feel bitter about it? Yes, I do. I feel very bitter about it. Uh, so what am I doing? I'm, uh, I'm running C.V. Star and Company and Star International. Uh, we're building it back into a major organization. When I left AIG, um, C.V. Star and Company had 300 people. We're about 1,000 right now, so we're adding employment to the country. Uh, and that's coming along. We're entering it. We're doing insurance, but we formed three new insurance companies. And we're doing business in probably about uh, 30 countries right now. We have a big Lloyd's operation. We operate throughout the European market. Um, I'm going to China next week. We're going to we'll have a joint venture in China um, by the end of April. Uh, we'll be in Southeast Asian countries, all of which we know for, for years and years. And we have a big investment operation. Uh, I'm giving you a, a shorthand version of what really is happening, but uh, uh, how much time have I got? Ten minutes. All right. Uh, so the I, I think it uh, there's a lot to be to be um, uh, to think about. 
Why did we get into this trouble uh, in the country? You know, what brought this about? How could a country as, as wise as we are and financially literate as we are uh, do what we did? And I have my own thoughts about that, but let me just rattle some of the reasons off that I think. There was a desire in this country during the Clinton administration that housing should be an opportunity for everybody. Everybody should have the right to own a home. There wasn't much, there wasn't much differentiation whether you can f afford one or not. Uh, historically in our country, uh, mortgages were granted by local banks who knew the individual uh, and would work with that individual if they got into any trouble. Uh, under the, when, the, when the Clinton administration decided to expand housing, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were buying mortgages from these local banks, and the local banks would only service the mortgage, but they really didn't have any, any financial involvement after the mortgage was sold. And uh, clearly many people got, uh, got mortgages and homes that couldn't afford it. Uh, so that was one thing that was gonna lead up to ultimately a problem. Second, investment banks in the United States uh, were leveraging their capital 30 and 40 times the capital. That's, that was outrageous. Going from say five and six times, or seven times your capital, to 40 and 50 and 30 times your capital uh, was obviously a risk that shouldn't have been taken. The SEC just ignored uh, that fact. Why? It's hard to understand. But it was clear that the, we were setting in motion uh, some conditions that would be very difficult to live with on a real-time basis. And of course, it was gonna cause problems. Then some of these investment banks said, look, uh, you know, our job is to be creative and create products. So they took some of these mortgages that were being now uh, written uh, by, for people who didn't have really the, the right to own a home. They, they just didn't have the financial needs. They didn't have the financial background for it. They packaged these mortgages into a product. They took mortgages, they said, from the east, the west, the south, and the northeast, put them all together, they said the, the diversification uh, is, is terrific, and that, that means you can have it, it will be, it'll be marked triple A. They went to the rating agencies and, and sold the rating agencies, Moody's and, and the rest, uh, that these, that this diversification, uh, they deserve a triple A rating. And the rating agencies accommodated them, didn't do very much analysis of their own, and they were marked triple A. And they sold these mortgages and these, these products, these CDOs, to every client and customer they could find all around the world. And of course, uh, they weren't AAA. And then, as I said earlier, um, these, these um, credit default swaps that would, would, would respond to a, uh, uh, normally a default had been changed so that you responded to a, just a reduction in value uh, just blew up in everybody's face. At the same time they were doing all of this, the uh, Accounting Principles Board, located here in Connecticut, uh, uh, came out with mark-to-market -market accounting. At the wrong, uh, they couldn't have picked a worse time uh, to do that. And that marked balance sheets uh, that you normally would carry, say, at cost, or held to maturity where you, you keep the value, you had to mark it down to a market value. And that destroyed capital artificially in many instances. That never should have happened. SEC, who oversees that, kept silent. Um, and so, so you had all of these things come together at the same time that led to the destruction that took place. There are other things that happened, I can go through a list of them, but, um, but um, I don't think the real story 
of what truly occurred in our country has been fully recognized yet. Generally, it will take a while. There have been a lot of books written, but on, generally on parts of it, not the entire issue. I testified before a couple of congressional committees uh, on this, um, particularly on the AIG issue. For example, um, by what right did the government have to take essentially 92% of AIG? To me, it was, a, it was an unlawful taking. Uh, what should have been done, and if you look at the other companies that they, that they aided, they aided Citigroup, and they got about 30% of the equity. That's different than 92%. Uh, and they aided several other companies the same way. Uh, so why was AIG uh, really <coughs> set aside and, uh, and used the way it was? AIG was a national asset. We have no insurance company that operates globally in 130 countries. When I tell you it was a national asset, I'm, I know what I'm talking about, because we did many things uh, that were beneficial to our country and our government. Um, and it was totally destroyed. Uh, they saved Goldman Sachs, AIG was used to save uh, many, including Goldman Sachs. Uh, but that story will come out. Uh, it's been alleged already in the newspapers and in articles and magazines, and you have it. But uh, anyway, I think I'll stop right here and take questions. So we have microphones here. No? Yeah, cool. Um, so when you were talking about the culture of your organization, you mentioned that you do not prefer having contracts with your employees. Um, and I'm wondering what that means not to have contract, and why do you do it? I didn't quite understand it. Contract. Yeah, I didn't think that um, you ought to hold an employee uh, and should be have a contract that you stay if you weren't doing the job. Um, but you have to start someplace, and it started with me. I, I refused the contract. Uh, I thought that if I wasn't doing the job, I shouldn't uh, be forced to stay in the company. They should have a right to have a new CEO. So I turned it down. Is that because the contract couldn't be explicit? Well, no, the contract say that if you have a five-year contract, at the end of three years, if the company's not doing well, why should you be, why should the company be forced to keep you for two more years? If you don't ask me a question, I'll ask you some questions. So, uh, I guess this is more of a, uh, a personal question. I was wondering what, so, you know, we're all in school and we don't have jobs yet. Um, and so in thinking about careers, it's, it's an important decision. So I was wondering what made you really enjoy your job? Was it the success you had? Was it the day-to-day the -day activities? Um, was it the, the impact you made uh, on uh, being a part of AIG? Well, I think it's many things. You have to love what you do to begin with. And, uh, and I love building. And, uh, and I love working with a group of people that we had. It was a very close group. Uh, and it was a lot of fun opening new markets and beating, beating our competitors. It was, a very, it was a very satisfying experience. And you have to love it. You, you have to have, a, the other thing I would say, you need a lot of energy. Uh, you gotta want, you know, work is, you know, it, work should not be viewed as a, you know, from, from nine to five. You work as long as you have to because you love doing it.
This also kind of reminds me of um, Bear Stearns and another um, very experienced chairman, Ace Greenberg, kind of warning his board. I, I, I'm not hearing you. This is on. Um, this, uh, like AIG, the story of AIG really reminds me of Bear Stearns' fall and of a really experienced you know, board member pointing out that what the company was doing wasn't great. So can you talk to, I guess, the idea of having experience in this field and the fact that you know, companies were kind of, boards weren't working was also like a core problem in the financial crisis. So can you tell me a little bit more about that and how you felt afterwards? You, I didn't quite hear that. Would you, would you hear? Boards were not working properly. Boards were not working properly is absolutely right. Um, the, um, uh, there was a lead director in the company. Look, we had a, if you go back to the history of AIG, uh, we had some outstanding people on the board. Uh, obviously over a period of time, some retire, some die. But we had, we had a pretty good board. Carla Hills, for example, was on the board. And she was an outstanding director. She had been in the cabinet of uh, George Bush the first. Uh, uh, she, was, she, was, she was a terrific uh, uh, director. Uh, Bill Cohn, who had been Secretary of Defense, was a director. Uh, uh, Dick Holbrook recently died as a director. So we had some good directors. Uh, on the other hand, when, uh, when Spitzer uh, threatened the company, uh, many of them uh, just folded. Not Carla Hills and not Bill Cohn, but many others. And uh, you, know, you don't know how people are going to respond until they're confronted with, a, with an issue. Uh, but there's no question that the board failed, in my judgment, uh, to recognize what was happening after I left. Um, so China has recently been experiencing rapid growth. Um, how do you think their growth, the change toward a consumption model, will change the insurance industry in China? What, uh, can you... Uh, the China, you're saying, has been growing rapidly? What is? Uh, how will that change the insurance industry in China? The insurance industry in China, how is it changing in their growth? Right? The, uh, With their rapid growth? It's changed dramatically. The largest insurance company in the world today by market value is China Life. Amazing growth in China, and you'd expect it to be up. China has passed the United States in the number of automobiles being sold a year. They all have to be insured. Uh, so the growth in the insurance industry in China is very rapid. Uh, very, in, in a way, yet, uh, very immature in many ways in understanding risk. Uh, but that'll, that'll change, but they've, they've come a long ways. When I first went to China and we entered our life company, uh, the, the life insurance industry in China was very small. And they didn't have agents selling life insurance. They had their employees selling life insurance. Uh, so if an employee uh, sold something, he would get paid. And he'd, he'd get paid whether he sold or not. So they had a fixed expense. We introduced an agency system in China and recruited thousands of agents. Um, and they got commissions if they sold something. If they didn't sell, they didn't get a commission. They, the Chinese companies quickly adapted to our system. So you could say that we created millions and millions of jobs in China. All right, so thank you. Um, I'm just wondering what do you think uh, a chartist in Sun America are currently all businesses and how you would evaluate uh, Robert Ben uh, as the current CEO? Look, I've known Bob Ben Moshe for 15, 20 years, and he's a decent man. He's, he's a good man. And he's, I think, a pretty good, good leader. Uh, he has very little experience internationally, and his experience has been in the life insurance sector, not in the non-life sector. And the, one of the largest components of AIG is the non-life sector. So he's, 
Uh, he's got a hard job in front of him. Uh, also, the, the most valuable assets have been sold. The AIA, which is um, the company that's entered in China, that, own, that AIG owns 100% of, they sold that, uh, which I wouldn't have done. And they sold uh, American Life to, to Metropolitan Life. That company does business in 55 countries around the world. You can't replicate that. I wouldn't have sold that. So AIG is a shadow of what it was before. Ben Moshe has got a tough job. He's a, um, he doesn't know the non-life business very well. And the culture of the company has been, is gone. Most of the people who work there, who are some of the better people, have left. Uh, many have come to me. And, working in the C.V. Star and Company and in our agencies and our insurance companies. Um, it's going to be a tough job. But he's a good man. I like him. Hi. Good morning. Uh, during your speech, you alluded to the destructive power of credit default swaps. And uh, what I find interesting is different countries have taken a very different approach. Some European countries have absolutely banned credit default swaps. China most notably introduced them in the market recently, but put a cap on the value with the underlying amount. Uh, so my question really is, what sort of regulation do you think would work well, both at the national level and possibly the international level? Uh, that's a good question. I would do at least two things. First, I would go back to way where credit default swap would only respond if the underlying instrument that it is supposedly insuring uh, defaults. In other words, I would not respond to just a reduction in value. Uh, because if you look at all those CDOs that, were, that, were, that, the, that the credit default swaps were covering, most of those have recovered in value. Okay, So that there was a temporary reduction in value, but they didn't default. And so what it led to was unnecessary chaos in the market. The second thing I would have is an exchange uh, where you could, where you get price discovery. Um, without price discovery, you're back where you were. And so you have to have that. And you'd have to put up reserves. If I was going to issue credit default swaps, you ought to reserve it like, a, if it's going to be an insurance instrument, treat it like an insurance instrument. And make, you, and, and make the underlying company who's issuing them, put up reserves. It can be a bit um, intimidating sometimes to hear or learn or read about the insurance industry because of the regulation and the billions and billillions of dollars that are always involved, uh, et cetera, as, as a student. Um, but I'm wondering, in addition to what you're doing yourself now with the uh, CV star, um, what, uh, what opportunities do you see for uh, entrepreneurship in the insurance industry today, if any? Well, I think there's tremendous um, opportunity for being an entrepreneur. You know, you're living in a changing world, uh, uh, changing economies. New products are being invented and developed every day. Uh, and uh, investments are going on in different parts of the world. All of that needs insurance. And so there's, there's great opportunity to be creative in the insurance industry and differentiate yourself from everybody else. Uh, I'm about to do a joint venture insurance company in China. Uh, the one we're doing the joint venture with is a very traditional company. Uh, we will change that in, in less than a year into something different. Uh, and, it's, and that's exciting to do that. So you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Hi. Um, do you think that, I mean, with the recent financial crisis, we've seen a lot of government uh, intervention and interaction with the sort of private world. And um, I was wondering, do you think that the government should have any role other than just keeping it, you know, keeping things fair? Do you think they should intervene when these companies are having big issues, like what happened to AIG? 
Do I think government should intervene? I think that uh, the least amount that's necessary. I don't think that, uh, I think that if, if you're asking the question too big to fail, uh, I think there are some institutions that probably would cause chaos if they failed. Uh, but I would, uh, I would make that very, very few and far between. But I, what troubles me is, the, is what happened in this, uh, this recession and government intervention. They picked and chose who they wanted to save and who they didn't. Uh, it wasn't even-handed. Uh, it was done with the intent to save some and not others. Uh, the real story of what happened has not been, not been printed yet. Uh, you know, after all, it, it's very common knowledge that Paulson, who was then Treasury Secretary, was surrounded by Goldman Sachs people. Uh, I'm not making that up. That happens to be, it happens to be a fact. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, how objective were they in, in, uh, in what they were deciding to do and, and not do? Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, there are times government has to intervene, but I happen to believe in, in, in the private sector, the, the ability of Americans to create jobs and businesses, and government should be small. Government-created jobs are not the best jobs. Private sector jobs are the best jobs. <coughs> In my judgment. Thank you. What role do you think that banks should play in the future to avoid a similar crisis? And do you think that there needs to be a different sense of what risk is? What's the last part? What kind of role should banks yeah, play yeah, in the yeah. future? And do you think that there needs to be a different definition of what risk is? A, a what risk is? Risk. Yeah, OK. Uh, when you say banks, you have to differentiate between commercial banks and investment banks. Uh, look, I, I think that the Dodd-Frank bill that has been passed uh, comes up with a whole new set of, of regulations. Let me touch on that in a minute. And uh, uh, will banks use their, their own capital uh, to, uh, uh, to do transactions that put the, puts the whole institution at risk? Probably will not be the way it was. I think the Volcker rule, uh, which, will, which would limit the amount of individual transactions that might endanger the bank are uh, going to be limited and have to use a off-balance sheet approach so that that doesn't pollute the rest of the bank. Investment banks, and for example, that may have done transactions that bet against their own clients, uh, I think should be outlawed. If, if an investment bank is selling me, say, invest in in the XYZ CDOs, and then they take a position against that. It seems to me that uh, that's immoral and uh, should, not be, should not be permitted. Now, the Dodd-Frank bill is, was, was enacted before they even had any of the response of, of all the investigations that were going on. It seems to me they should have waited and hear what, you know, what the investigators had come up with before they passed a new law. The, now the Congress has to uh, provide for the financing of these, all these new regulators that have been going to be created under the Dodd-Frank bill. And I'm not sure that's going to happen. I'm not so sure that uh, all of them are necessary. Well, we need a better regulators, not more regulation. We had plenty of regulation. If they had enforced the regulations that were in existence, we would have avoided a great deal, if not all, of what took place. Hi. You mentioned earlier about how AIG attracted and retained the best people in the business, and that's how they grew, because of you know, the strong culture there. 
But um, if you're starting a new company or even entering you know, in a management position at a current company, how do you go about building that type of culture that just fosters growth? How do you build the culture that you talk about? The culture starts at the top. Okay? It's got to start with the, the individual running the company. And uh, the same thing as I say in uh, risk management. The CEO is the top risk manager in the company. You have other people involved, but you're the risk manager. You decide how much risk you really want to take. And the same thing is true in culture. You build a culture based upon your performance, what you stand for, what you believe in, and you surround yourself with people who share those beliefs. And if they don't, they'll, be, they'll, they'll feel out of step. All right, thank you very much. Well, I'm very pleased that we have Hank Greenberg here today. We've already talked about him and his career. Uh, let me just reiterate it. It's the most amazing career. Uh, it starts when you landed on D-Day, right? On Omaha Beach. That's amazing. <laughs> and at age 17, 18? A little over 18 then. Uh, and, and this goes way, and then liberated, uh, participated in the liberation of Dachau after, at the end of World War II. And then, not to be stopped, was involved in the Korean War as well. And then uh, took over an insurance company and made it into the most important insurance company in the world. Uh, and uh, experienced a number of vicissitudes connected with that as well. So uh, I, I was uh, asking Mr. Greenberg if he would talk about uh, what he did, how he made this uh, enormous success, uh, what kind of, uh, uh, we're interested in finance here, so it's something about how it was financed, but that, as we've been emphasizing in this course, it's more than just mathematical CAPM modeling, it's about incentivizing people, about finding people with the right character, and uh, I think that you can tell us <laughs> about your um, experiences and what you've learned for so many years. So I'll, I'll turn over to you, and then we'll have, uh, we'll, st we'll stop at around 10, and then we have time for a few questions from you. All right, Mr. Right. Greenberg. Good morning. Let me start really uh, uh, picking up with a professor. I enlisted in the Army when I was 17. I hadn't finished high school. Uh, World War II was on. I felt I wanted to do something, and I was bored. Uh, so I was able to uh, fix a birth certificate so it said I was 18. And uh, they had very untamed at that moment. Uh, you know, just only about four days before that, uh, I still almost had mud on my boots. And so uh, I went down to the main floor, looked around the directory, and there was a resident vice president by the name of Bob, Bob, Bob Reed. I just walked into his office and said, you have a, the word I used was not the one I use now, uh, you don't have a very good personnel director. And uh, I was a little more excited than that. And um, I wound up getting a job. And I started as a junior underwriter in the insurance business. So what is a junior underwriter? You, annual, uh, you analyze risks and decide whether the company wants to write those risks or not. Um, and I had to get a job because I said I was married and had responsibilities. And I kind of liked it. Uh, I was working in this, what they call the Special Risk Division, uh, which was uh, uh, different kinds of risks almost every day. Some were sports risks, uh, some was um, accidental death thing for executives. It was a whole range of different risks you had to analyze. I found it interesting. I became the youngest vice president in the history of that company. I moved to Chicago where its head office was. And uh, 
about uh, a couple of years later, um, it's a long story, so I won't take you through. I met Star, C.V. Star, who was the founder of the company that I chair today. Um, Star started his company in China in 1919, a uh, long time. And obviously, during World War II, he had to leave, um, came back to the United States. And uh, he had a series of, of uh, small insurance companies. And um, I was intrigued uh, with his business because it operated outside the United States, by and large. He had one company in the United States called the American Home, uh, which really was a failure. It was not doing well, and he was embarrassed by that fact that uh, uh, a company that was not doing well, that he owned, his other business, he represented American companies in doing business overseas. It was called the AIU, American International Underwriters. It was one of a kind, and it operated mostly in Asia, uh, one or two European countries, but by and large, it was it had a it had a uh, uh, its its background was really Asian, having started in China, uh, as I said, 1919. So anyway, I joined uh, Star and took over the American home uh, in New York, which I said was was not doing well. It was a it was a failure. Now what was what was wrong with it? Uh, it did business through agents, and depending upon the skill of a company, uh, would determine the quality of the agents that it had. And, and while it was an old company, it, was, it had a very poor agency organization. Uh, and so the quality of its business uh, was very, very, very poor. So it was losing money uh, year in and year out. Uh, and uh, the job I had was to turn it around. Uh, to cut that short, I got rid of all the agents and went into what they call the brokerage business. Instead of writing small businesses, we began writing large commercial risks. And we needed a lot of reinsurance. I went to London, got Lloyd's to back uh, that, uh, that strategy. Um, and uh, up to then, most of the large risks were being written in London at Lloyd's. Very few American companies uh, had the skills to underwrite large, complicated risks, whether it was large property risk or casualty or marine, aviation, very difficult risks. Um, and we had no problem taking me because they weren't looking too closely. Uh, I went to Europe, went to England first, I got there in 1943, a year before the invasion, spent a year training, uh, left England, went to the continent, obviously on D-Day. And went all the way through Europe, um, linked up with the Russians in Linz, Austria. The war was then over, uh, came back. I had to finish high school, uh, which, was a, uh, which was a chore, coming back in, uh, after being in a war. And, Going back to high school was one of the toughest times of my life, actually. Uh, but I did. Went on to college and um, law school. Uh, finished law school and the Korean War broke out. I was a reserve officer. I had gotten commissioned toward the end of the war. Um, spent the year in Korea. Um, separated as a captain. Came close to staying in the military. Um, because I was fairly young and had moved up pretty well in rank and uh, was offered uh, trying to incentivize me to stay in the military, but I didn't. Um, but I finished law school and came back. I was married by then, married, just a married uh, girl that I met in college, um, and uh, I had to get a job. Uh, I didn't feel like practicing law um, I didn't think I had a law degree. I didn't think I wanted to do that. So I was visiting. I came back from Korea, and uh, the next day 
went down to visit some of my friends who had been went to law school with, and uh, it convinced me that I didn't want to practice law. And as I left their office, I went by an insurance company, a Continental Casualty Company, and I thought I'd um, see if they had a job opening. So I went in, went up to the uh, personnel director, and he was kind of nasty. Now, I had just come back from Korea, and I, I came back, I had orders to fly back, so I was really assembled a group of, of quality underwriters, um, and we were, and we started doing that. We ultimately became the largest uh, brokerage underwriting company in the United States. We were going to run out of capital. We were growing so rapidly and successfully. Um, so I looked around for a couple of other companies that had the same uh, problems that we had uh, before we turned it around. Um, found one called the National Union. Uh, we bought that, got rid of all of its agents and agency business, and consolidated that into American Home. Kept its identity, because it was a very old company. It was one of the oldest companies in the United States. And then uh, subsequently bought the, uh, the New Hampshire Insurance Company, did the same thing. By now it's 19, uh, in the mid-60s, and by 1967, I created AIG, put a holding company on top of these three companies, and AIG was born. Um, in 67, I also became the, the, uh, the head of C.V. Star & Company, which was the owner, by and large, of these insurance companies. Uh, Star died in 1968, but he saw the beginning of AIG that was formed. We also owned a life insurance company called American Life that did business outside the United States. And we consolidated that into AIG. So we had both a life and a non-life business. And we were expanding internationally. We ultimately did business in 130 countries. We opened markets around the world. We introduced new uh, types of insurance. One of the things that made us different was that we continue to, to evolve new products that by the business or, or, or individuals needed. For example, we were the first ones to introduce directors and officers liability insurance in the United States. We introduced political risk insurance, American companies doing business in very difficult